Good morning. Uh, as you can see, the title of today's lecture is Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous Houses and Villas at Pompeii. We spoke last time about the public architecture of Pompeii, about the forum, about the temples, about the basilica, about the baths, and also about uh, shops and tombs as well. Uh, but today we're going to turn to the residential architecture of Pompeii, uh, residential architecture that is extremely important, not only for what it tells us about Pompeii, but what it also tells us about domestic architecture in the first centuries BC and the first century AD, because uh, there is no place where the uh, houses are better preserved than at Pompeii. So it tells us again not just about the city itself, but also about residential architecture in Rome, where we have very few examples, and elsewhere in the Roman world. I want to begin with the image that you see now on the screen, which is a building, uh, and we're talking about the one at the far at the left, uh, a, a front left, a building that is on one of Pompeii's main thoroughfares, the Via del Abundanza, the Via del Abundanza, the Street of Abundance. And the building in question is, is relatively well preserved. And what is significant about it, about it for us right now is the fact that it is two-storied, as you can see here. What we'll see in the course of today's presentation is that most of the buildings, most of the houses in early Pompeii are single-storied dwellings. Uh, but here we see one that is two-storied. And this two-story dwelling actually dates fairly late in the history of residential architecture in Pompeii. It dates sometime between the earthquake of 62 and the eruption of Vesuvius of 79, so between 62 and 79 AD. And we see that, that it has two stories in this instance, a story down below that may have been, that it says has entranceways, might even have been opened up as a shop, and then a second story uh, that is very interesting indeed, and it has uh, what we call canoculi, C-E-N-A-C-U-L-A-E, -E, canoculi, which are second story dining rooms uh, that have open panoramic windows. Uh, these windows, as you can see, through columns, so an interesting nod uh, to uh, Hellenization once again, this idea of incorporating Greek elements into Roman architecture. Uh, elements that again are under that are that come into Roman architecture through the influence of earlier Greek architecture, uh, and views out through those columns. So two important points: one that these are have two stories, and that the second that adding a second story to a Roman building uh, is or a Pompeian building in this instance doesn't occur until between the earthquake and the eruption of Vesuvius. And secondarily, this idea of the picture window. And we've talked about the importance for the Romans of vista and panorama. And they're doing it here. They're opening up that second floor so that you can sit in one of these dining rooms and then have a very nice view out through the columns of the street and the street life below. Now, this building uh, on the uh, Via della Abundanza lies at the end of the development of Pompeian domestic architecture. And so what I'm going to do is take us back to the beginning and uh, trace Rome, uh, Pompeian domestic architecture from the Samnite period up through the eruption of Vesuvius. With regard to the earliest houses at Pompeii, these were done during, uh, again, the Samnite period, the 4th and 3rd centuries BC. Keep in mind that the Samnites were an Italic tribe that is indigenous to Italy from way back when. I had mentioned to you that Pompeii was founded already in the 8th century BC. Uh, and these Italic tribes uh, built houses, obviously, in which they lived uh, already in the 4th and 3rd, <coughs> substantial houses in which they lived already in the 4th and 3rd centuries BC. I want to begin our conversation about uh, domestic architecture in Pompeii and, and by extension in Rome itself with the so-called Domus Italica. Uh, what was the Domus Italica? The Domus Italica was an ideal Roman house plan. And we know quite a bit about it because of the writings of Vitruvius. Vitruvius, not to be con confused with Vesuvius, Vitruvius was an architectural theoretician who was writing in the age of Augustus. 
uh, Augustus being Rome's first emperor. And Vitruvius left a great deal of writings about all kinds of architecture, including domestic architecture. And he talks in detail about the Domus Italica, or the uh, uh, or, or the what he considered the ideal Roman house. And he describes all of its parts. And through his writings, we can uh, explore together what the ideal Roman house was. And what you're going to find very interesting, I believe, is the fact that the actual houses at Pompeii conform, or the earliest houses conform very closely to this ideal plan. Let's run through it together, both in plan and in restored view. Again, I'm going to need to go over a lot of terminology here, um, but I guarantee you I'm going, to I'm going to repeat it enough today that it will be indelibly marked on your minds and you won't even have to, I, I don't think you'll even have to study this when the time comes because you're going to know these parts of the house, houses so well after we go through them today. Here you see the plan of the typical Domus Italica. You can see it number one is the entrance into the house. The entrance to the house was called the Fauces, F-A-U-C-E-S, the Fauces or the throat of the house. Sometimes the Fauces was, uh, had it before it a, a vestibule called a vestibulum, and all of these uh, words are on the monument list for you. A vestibulum, which was a place uh, right before the beginning of the Fauces, uh, underneath the eaves of the house where you could actually stand, uh, get, get in from the rain in case it was raining outside while you waited for the door to be open. But in these early, these very early Domus Italica houses, we don't tend to see the vestibulum. So think it away for the moment. Just the falcase or throat of the house. Then on either side of the falcase, there are two rooms uh, which are called cells or celli, cella uh, in the singular and celli, C-E-L-L-A-E, in the plural. These can be treated in a number of different ways. They can either be closed off from the street uh, and used as interior rooms for the house, be extra bedrooms or uh, living and, and li living spaces, or they can be, as you see them in this ideal plan, opened up to the street. When they are opened up to the street, they take on the role of shops or tabernae, T-A-B-E-R-N-E, shops or tabernae. And those shops could be either used by those who own the house uh, to make additional money, uh, or they could be leased out uh, to others, to others for uh, their shops. Uh, you can see uh, the Falces leads into the most important room of a Roman house, the so-called atrium, the famous atrium of the Roman house, A-T-R-I-U-M. Uh, the atrium was the uh, audience hall of the house, and it's important to mention from the outset that Roman houses had a very different role in Roman society than houses do for us today. We tend to think of our houses today in large parts as retreats, as places we could get away from it all, get away from work, get away from schoolwork, and so on, and escape. Although we do enjoy, obviously, having friends and family uh, visit us there, we tend to think of it as a place of retreat. This was not true in Roman times when the house was also a place to do some very serious business. The man of the house, the head of the household, the pater familias, often greeted clients in the atrium of the house. And when he was away on business or away at war, his wife, the mater familias, would stand in for him, and she would conduct business in the atrium. So considered a very public part of the house, a place where you wanted it to look its best because you were going to be greeting important visitors there to do business. So the atrium is located here. You can see this rectangular pool in the center of the atrium. That is the impluvium, and you have that on the monument list, the impluvium of the house, which is a pool in which they collected rainwater for daily use. How did they collect that rainwater? Because there was a, an opening in the ceiling, uh, also rectangular in shape. That's called a compluvium, and, that, and the compluvium uh, had, a, had surrounding it a slanted roof to encourage the water, obviously, to slide in through the compluvium and land in the impluvium down below. Uh, around the atrium and also around the impluvium are at four here are the uh, bedrooms of the house, the cubiculum in the singular and cubicula in the plural the cubicula, or bedrooms of the house, and you can see that each one of them opens up off the atrium. They are very small in size, smaller than any other rooms in the house, and they were literally just a place to sleep. Uh, they were very small, mostly very dark, 
Some of them had slit windows. I'll show you one of those later. Many of them didn't have any windows. They were literally just sleeping spaces. Over here at five, we see the wings or the alai, A-L-A-E, the wings or the alai, Allah in the singular, alai of the house. The wings of the house were a very important place in the point of view of family tradition and religious practice and so on. It was the place where the Romans kept the shrines of their ancestors. They had wooden shrines. They were usually made out of wood with, um, with doors. Uh, and they kept inside those the uh, busts and portraits of their ancestors. And they would take those out. They would open those shrines up and take those out on special occasions, usually anniversaries marking uh, the anniversary of the death of the deceased. And it, they had an interesting practice in which the member of the family who most closely resembled the <coughs> deceased in size and general appearance would put on that mask uh, and participate in a kind of parade uh, in honor of the dead. So they kept those in those shrines, in the wings or the ally of the house. Here at six on axis, and we know how much the Romans liked axiality as well as symmetry, uh, we see the, uh, the room over here at six is on axis with the fauces and the atrium. This room is called the tablinum, T-A-B-L-I-N-U-M. The tablinum, which started as the master bedroom of the house, the most important bedroom, much larger than the cubicula. Uh, but over time, it became a place where the family archives were kept. And, and beyond that, and we'll see it happening pretty early actually today, uh, it becomes almost a kind of passageway uh, between the atrium and the area that lay beyond here. At seven, we see uh, the, also a fairly large room, the dining room or triclinium. And you can see in this case, in the ideal Roman house, it opens off the atrium. So easy to get to from the atrium. And then at the back, number eight, uh, for one of these ideal Roman houses, the hortus, H-O-R-T-U-S, or the garden of the house, which was obviously open to the sky. If you look at the restored view, uh, you can see how, in the, how, these ver how these earliest houses really had a very enclosed feeling. They were quite stark and geometrically ordered with very few openings. Uh, you can see in this case, this one opening uh, as an entranceway into the foul case as well as into two shops as you can see here. And then, of course, the compluvium, a hole in the ceiling. And then the hortus is open to the sky. But other than that, there are no windows whatsoever. It's a very enclosed uh, structure. And we're going to see that although that's the case in the beginning, that changes over time. Uh, we'll see a very important and interesting evolution. Now, as I'm, uh, uh, another point that I want to make from the start is, is just as in temple architecture, and we've traced it, the development of early Roman temple architecture, where we saw the, the Romans ultimately using, combining an Etruscan plan with a Greek elevation. We're going to see something actually quite similar happening in the development of uh, Pompeian and Roman domestic architecture. We're going to see that Etruscan, earlier Etruscan uh, monuments had an impact. And I show you uh, a plan of an Etruscan tomb over here. We've looked at this before, an Etruscan tomb over here, just to show you that the general arrangement of that tomb uh, with an entranceway here, with two rooms over here, kind of like the tabernae that we looked at, or the cells that we looked at just before. A big space over here, not unlike the atrium. The idea of axiality, entering into it, then this large space, then another space which mirrors the tablinum, or is like the tablinum of the Roman house, and then other rooms on either side. So this whole idea, this progression of one space, on an axial progression of one space to another space to, an, to another space that's on the same axial focus, uh, very important. And I think those um, who were building these fairly early on, the Samnites and so on, were clearly looking at Etruscan uh, examples. And it shows us very early on also that in the minds of the Romans, there was a very close association between the houses of the living and the houses of the dead. Because if you look at the inside of this Etruscan tomb, and I mention it, I'm not holding you responsible for it, but I mention it to you underneath the Domus Italica on the monument list. This is the tomb of the shields and seats in Cerveteri of the 6th century BC. Uh, and if you look at it, you can see that inside the tomb, it's all carved from the rock, from the tufa rock. You can see that it looks very much like what you'd expect a house to look like, with beds. Uh, and notice the detail. They've even provided, it's all done in stone, the tufa stone. 
uh, but you see they've even provided stone pillows here, not very comfortable, but it gives you the sense of, of what a house would have been like. And we know that, houses, that beds in houses look very much like these. Over here, a throne with a nice footstool, as you can see. And then if you look very carefully, also indicated in stone, the rafters, the beams uh, done in stone, and then the moldings around the door and around the shields, which is the, way, the reason this is called the shields and the seats, obviously, is because it has seats and it has shields on the, uh, on the wall. So I just wanted to make the point, because it'll turn up a number of times in the course of the semester, the close association in the minds of the Romans between cities of the, uh, houses of the living and houses of the dead. And also that important point that the uh, early Samnite builders are looking at Etruscan prototypes. I want to show you now the way in which actual Pompeian houses conform very closely, the early ones at least, of the 4th and 3rd centuries BC, conform very closely to this Domus Italica ideal plan. I want to begin with the so-called House of the Surgeon in Pompeii, which dates to the 3rd century BC. And it's called the House of the Surgeon because of all the surgical instruments that were found uh, in the house. And I show you the array of them now on the screen. Uh, this should uh, be of considerable interest to, especially, and I know there are a number of you in here, students whose major is biology. And I want to mention also that you'd be, you might be surprised to hear, but maybe not, Yale has such amazing collections, that the medical school has a collection of surgical instruments that goes way back, and it goes way back to ancient Rome. You can actually see ancient Roman surgical instruments in that collection uh, that we have here at Yale. Uh, not perhaps as many as this, but a, an interesting selection, uh, and uh, it, it, those of you who are in that field might in, it, at one point want to take advantage of that and get to see them firsthand. So this house got its name from this cache of surgical instruments that were found inside uh, that probably gives us some sense of the profession of at least one of the people who was living here. I show you uh, the plan of the house of the surgeon, and you'll see a version on your monument list that actually has the rooms uh, designated there, which I don't have here. Uh, so that will be helpful to you as you, I wanted you to have that version so that you could, when you're studying, uh, you have that before you. And uh, in any, any exam, by the way, even if I show something slightly different in class, I will show you only what is on your monument list in the exam. So those are the ones that you should study and remember. But you'll see the plan is exactly the same. It just doesn't have the labels here. So we can see that it conforms the House of the Surgeon, 3rd century BC, to the ideal Adomus Italica plan. You enter here, you enter into the falces or throat of the house. There are two cells, one on either side. It's very clear in plan that this cell is closed to the outside and opens only off the atrium, so used by the family uh, for their own purposes. This one is open to the street, clearly used as a shop, either by this family or they've leased it out to somebody else. The atrium is on axis with the falces. We can see that the atrium has a pool, a rectangular pool or impluvium, and there would have been a compluvium up above. On either side, the cubicula or bedrooms of the house opening off the atrium. Over here, the wings or ally of the house for the ancestral shrines. Over here again, uh, a dining room, a triclinium that opens off the atrium. Up here, we think probably a portico, a few col one column or two, but that might belong to a later renovation, and I'll explain why in a moment. And then in the back, a somewhat irregularly shaped hortus or garden. But I think you can see from this example how closely these actual houses track uh, the Domus Italica described by Vitruvius. Another example of one of these early Roman houses that conforms to the Domus Italica type is the so-called House of Sallust in Pompeii that dates to the 3rd century BC. This is another house that has uh, it, the Domus Italica as its core, uh, but just like most of the houses in Pompeii, you'll remember, remember how when the Romans took over Pompeii in 80, or made Pompeii a Roman colony, they tossed the Samnites out of their homes, they took them over, and of course once they took them over, they renovated them. So there's a quite a bit of renovation that takes place to some of these early Samnite houses, and in this case, the House of Sallust uh, seems to be an example of that. But we still see the original core of the Domus Italica, the entrance over here uh, into the falces of the house. 
Uh, one, uh, well, I'll say something about that in a moment. The atrium on axis with that with the impluvium. The cubicula over here. The ali or wings here. The tablinum of the house over here. In this case, you can see uh, that the triclinium opens up off the toward the hortus instead. This family wanted to provide views of the hortus rather than the atrium from the dining hall. Now what's particularly interesting and may belong to uh, the renovation is the shops that are opening up off the street because you can tell in plan exactly how this shop was used. Anyone volunteer to say based on the plan? What kind of a shop was this? A fast food store, yes, a fast food shop, a thermopolium, because we can see the counter and we can see the recesses in plan. So this family either had or let, let its space out uh, for one of these thermopolia, for one of these fast food stands uh, in the front of their house. So two examples, the uh, House of the Surgeon and the House of Sallust that conform closely, 3rd century BC, to the original Domus Italica plan. In the 2nd century BC, we see something happen in house design, quite extraordinary, and that is linked uh, to the same kind of development we saw in temple architecture, and that is uh, yes, they've been looking at the Etruscan type of plan. They've been conforming to that to a certain extent. All of a sudden, in the second century, they get the bug uh, to make their houses look more Greek. And they begin to incorporate elements uh, that they take from earlier Greek architecture. And the uh, result is quite extraordinary. I'm showing you here an example of an ideal uh, plan of what we call the Hellenized domus, the domus that has been Hellenized, that has been given Greek, it has been uh, enhanced with Greek elements. Uh, and we, let's want, run through the plan again uh, of the so-called Hellenized domus type. Uh, you can see that uh, the core is the same as the domus italica. You enter over here. Here we can see in plan the incorporation of the vestibulum, this vestibule that, com that, that, that uh, is located right in front of or at the beginning of the falces, uh, the purpose of which, you can see it right here, the purpose of which you just you kind of entered into the house, the, the roof of the house protects you in case the weather is not good, uh, but you still have to stand in that vestibule until you're allowed uh, into the falces and the rest of the house. So we see here the vestibulum, the falces, the two cells, cell I, one on either side, in this case they are not opened up as shops, the uh, atrium here with its impluvium to catch rainwater. At four, we have the usual uh, cubicula or bedrooms. At five, we have the usual ali or wings. And then six, the tablinum on axis with seven, the triclinium opening off the atrium. So once again, the core of the original Domus Italica very much intact in the Hellenized Domus. But look what's happened up here. What's happened up here is at number eight, uh, under the influence of Greek architecture, under the influence of what's happening in temple architecture, they incorporate columns into the interior of the house, uh, and they place their garden here. It's a garden court uh, with columns, which technically is called a peristyle, P-E-R-I-S-T-Y-L-E, -E, and it is comparable to what we see in temple architecture when we saw uh, the ar the uh, architects um, giving some of the temples the peripteral colonnade. Remember the colonnade that goes all the way around and is freestanding under the influence of Greek architecture? It's the same sort of thing here, except it's on the inside of the building. So this peristyle court, cum garden, uh, located right here. And then on either side, additional bedrooms or cubicula. These were probably very desirable to have uh, a bedroom that opened, had a nice view out over your garden. And then back here, two additional uh, tri uh, triclinia, two additional dining rooms uh, to take advantage of the beautiful views uh, that one could get, if one could see it, probably not terribly much through these narrow doorways, but at least opening up onto uh, the peristyle court. We see, Neil, one second, just we see th up here the restored view showing the same, the entranceway. And look here, you can even see columns added 
uh, in the front to announce from the very start that this is a house uh, that, is, that, is, that, o that is owned by a very cultured individual who knows his Greek uh, and knows his Greek culture uh, and knows to uh, incorporate these Greek elements into his house. And then we see the compluvium, we see the peristyle from above, you can see open to the sky with columns, but still very stark, very plain on the outside, no windows to speak of, very much an enclosed space. Neil. Some of these houses did have kitchens, and I'll show you an example in a moment. And probably more of them did than, we, than we're sure of. Uh, it's just a question of what remains in terms of being able to determine that. But we certainly have examples of that, so they did seem to have kitchens. So now I want to show you some examples of houses that conform to the Hellenized domus type. Uh, this being the first one, it's one of the most famous houses in Pompeii. And if you're making, if you're going there anytime soon and are making a list of must-sees, this is one of those must-sees in Pompeii, the house of the Vedii. The Vedi, we think it belongs, although we're not absolutely sure, to the Vedius brothers, to the Vedius brothers in Pompeii. And it dates, as the monument uh, list indicates, to the second century BC and later. Looking at this plan, uh, you can see the way in which it conforms to the Hellenized domus type. Once again, it has the core. It has the domus italica core. The entranceway over here with the falces. The cells on either side, th in this case used as uh, rooms internal to the house. They do not open off the street as shops. The atrium here with the impluvium. A smaller number of cubicula on either side. Uh, ally over here. Look what has happened to the tablinum. The tablinum is gone, essentially. All it consists of is uh, a couple of, uh, of pilasters uh, that are located right here, and I'll show them to you in a moment because it's well preserved. Pilasters here. So it, the tablinum has essentially disappeared. It's become a kind of passageway uh, from the core of the house into the garden. And it is a peristyle garden surrounded by columns, as you can see. And you can see how important that peristyle garden has become. This family has decided to decrease uh, their other space in order to have this stupendously large garden here. And they have also put a very large dining hall, triclinium, up here that opens off the peristyle. And it has a much bigger opening uh, so that they could clearly dine and get views of this, uh, of this garden, uh, this peristyle garden, of which they were obviously incredibly proud. Uh, so some, some major changes there. Now this particular house, oh, I do, did want to say, though, despite those changes, the house is still very enclosed and very, uh, very plain and stark from the outside. This is a restored view of what we believe the outside looked like, sort of geometrically ordered cubic, as you can see. Uh, just one entranceway, possibly a few small windows, possibly not. Uh, and then you can see the compluvium and the peristyle court. But otherwise, very much enclosed like the earlier Domus Italica. Not much change with regard to how the exterior of the building is treated. This, again, is one of the reasons everyone flocks to this house, is it's very well preserved. There's been some restoration work, of course, uh, but it really, this is one of those must-sees because it really gives you as good a sense as anything of what these houses looked like in antiquity. We have obviously entered into, we've come through the Falques, uh, we are standing in the atrium, we can see the pool or impluvium here. We can see the compluvium, very well preserved up above. I think it's probably the best preserved compluvium that we have or close to it. And you can see that there were little antifixes added in terracotta and stuff as decoration up at the top. As we're standing here, uh, we look back through what was once the tablinum and now is basically a point of transition, a passageway uh, from the atrium to the most important part of the house from the point of view of these patrons, the garden. Uh, so you're looking through, you see these great piers uh, uh, on either side that are all that's left of the tablinum. You look through that and you see the garden. The garden has its columns surrounding it. The walls are painted of that, of that garden, uh, all a very lively and wonderful uh, interior. And what also comes ver becomes very clear in looking at this particular view is something that we've already discussed, and that is the importance in the minds of the Romans of vista or panorama. 
of great views that you can see from one part of a building to another. Remember the sanctuary of Jupiter Anxer at Terracina and all of those wonderful lateral and, and axial uh, entrances and exits where there were all kinds of interesting light effects. We see the same sort of thing here. The idea is to pass from a particularly well-lighted area outside into a darker area, the falces. Then a little bit more light added to the system through the compluvium, and then a whole host of light uh, that you can see in the distance through the open, because of the open peristyle. So dark light, dark light. Uh, and this progression of space, this progression of light uh, through this structure, a, a very typical Roman thing to do. Uh, a, the other, other thing, of course, is this emphasis on axiality, the, of this movement through a structure in a very axial way. Uh, the uh, garden here, as it looks today, it would have been, of course, even more beautiful in antiquity when it would have been in better shape. But nonetheless, this gives you, it's a bit overgrown now and so on, but it gives you some sense of what it would have looked like with the greenery in the garden, surrounded by the columns with, uh, you know, with, with garden furniture, uh, little fountains, uh, little marble fountains and the like. Uh, and with the walls, the paintings are not in very good shape today, but imagine them more vibrant. And I'm going to show you examples of that on Thursday and next week of some of the paintings that are in better condition, how vibrant this would have been with those paintings. Look also at the columns because you can see, we'll see that some of these columns are made out of stone. Uh, some of them are made out of uh, those um, those tiles, those that look like bricks that I've shown you before. But in all cases, they were stuccoed over white. Why were they stuccoed over white? To make them look like Greek marble. So once again, this Hellenization of Roman domestic architecture, this attempt to make uh, these things look as Greek as possible. Neil, you asked about the kitchen. Well, this is our best preserved kitchen uh, from Pompeii. It's really quite amazing. There's a stove and the pots and pans that were clearly uh, still sitting on the um, sitting on, on the stove at the time this particular family had to flee uh, from the um, from the from Vesuvius. And I, I neglected to show you, but you can look at the monument list um, for this plan where the where the rooms are marked. Uh, you will see the kitchen marked on that plan, and you will also see what's called the women's quarters marked on that plan, which was probably where uh, the, some of the slaves who were owned by this particular family, the Vettius brothers, uh, lived in that, in that area. Another example of a house that conforms, a Pompeian house that conforms to the Hellenized domus type is the one that you now see on the screen. It's a plan of the house of the silver wedding, in Pompeii, we believe it was remodeled in the first century BC, although it's controversial. It might have been remodeled a bit later in the first century AD. Uh, it, um, it's an interesting structure. It got its name, the House of the Silver Wedding, because it, there was a lot of fanfare in the late 19th century, I think it was precisely 1893, when the king and queen of Italy came to visit this particular house, this, and it became their favorite. And uh, so the silver wedding is actually a reference to them and to their marriage and, and so on and so forth. It's a wonderful house, and I think you can see uh, how it conforms. Again, it has a core that is very much the Domus Italica core, but it is another example of one of these houses that has been remodeled uh, because of the, paper, the uh, owner's interest in Hellenizing that house. We enter here through the falques. Uh, there are cells on either side opening off the falques. That's an unusual uh, arrangement. Uh, then over here, the, uh, the uh, atrium with the impluvium, the cubiculi on either side, the, cell, the uh, ally or wings of the house, a dining room over here. Uh, two peristyle courts, one in the back, a smaller one, and then a huge peristyle court over here on the left-hand side. So for this family, one was not enough. They wanted double the garden space, uh, and they've, they've allotted a lot of space in this house to those gardens. Then, most interesting of all, I think, about this house, and the reason I chose it to show to you, uh, is that we are starting to see the Hellenization of the atrium as well, because look what's happened to the atrium. Uh, they have placed four columns around the impluvium in the atrium. So it wasn't enough to have these two large peristyles. They wanted columns everywhere. And they placed these four around the impluvium. A, an atrium that has four columns in it is technically called, and I put it on the monument list for you, a tetrastyle atrium. This is a tetrastyle atrium.
Even that wasn't enough. Look at that room in the upper left. Uh, that room in the upper left is a banqueting hall, uh, an additional dining space, but a special dining space that you can see opens up very nicely off the smaller peristyle of the house. The opening is fairly wide, so it probably would have had some wonderful views of the peristyle garden. And look, there are four columns in there as well. Uh, and this particular banqueting hall, its technical name's got a kind of a funny name that I don't think you'll forget, uh, called an ecus, O-E-C-U-S, and it's even more amusing in the plural because the, the plural is O-E-C-I, eki, eki. So uh, this is an ecus uh, among eki, uh, an ecus up there, and you can see that it's an ecus that has four columns in it, so we call it a tetrastyle ecus. All right, so now that we've had an opportunity to look at the plan of the House of the Silver Wedding, I want to give you a sense of what the building looks like today. It's not as well preserved as the House of the Vedii, uh, but we can get a very good sense of what it was like in antiquity. And the Ecus, uh, which in some respects is the most important room in the house from our standpoint, uh, is very well preserved. We're looking here at a view. We're standing again in the beginning of the atrium. Uh, looking through the atrium, we see the impluvium of the house, a lot of moss and some over, you know, it's overgrown uh, today. Uh, but nonetheless, you can see it there as well as the compluvium above. What's most important to us is you can see that this is indeed a tetrastyle atrium uh, with four columns that are surrounding the impluvium. Uh, those columns and those columns supporting the ceiling and of course the compluvium above. Also interesting is the way in which the columns are treated. You can see that they have been fluted and then stuccoed over. Do you remember the temple at Cori that we looked at where we talked about the fact that uh, the Temple of Hercules at Cori, we talked about the fact that the columns uh, were fluted part of the way and then down below those flutes were covered over with stucco and the stucco was painted. We see the same thing here and if you look very, very closely, you can even see the remains of the red paint, the red paint that decorated uh, the lower part of these columns. So some interesting correspondences there in terms of building practice. You can also see here, as we saw in the House of the Vedii, this wonderful vista from the atrium of the house through what remains of the tablinum into the garden of the house, uh, the peristyle garden of the house, which from the patron's point of view was one of the most important, or if not the most important part of the house. This is the ecus of the house uh, of the silver wedding, and you can see it is extremely well preserved, and you can also see how very interesting it is in all kinds of ways. It is a tetrastyle ecus, again a banqueting hall, tetrastyle ecus uh, with four columns. Uh, those columns are stuccoed and painted over. The paint is very well preserved. It's a reddish purplish color, uh, probably meant to conjure up Porphyry, P-O-R-P-H-Y-R-Y, a porphyry which comes only from Egypt. It's only quarried in Egypt. Very expensive uh, to bring it that great distance all the way to Pompeii. Uh, and of course, this isn't porphyry. It's just a painted column. But the whole idea of this, from the point of the point of the, pa the patron's point of view, was to look like he. Uh, he and she were very well healed, uh, that they could afford uh, to bring, uh, th th they're trying to make the illusion that they could afford to bring uh, this expensive stone from very far away to use in their house here. Uh, look also at the fact that the, uh, the, the, there's a barrel vault. Uh, this is actually a wooden vault rather than a concrete vault here in this room, but very nicely done, and the walls are extensively painted. Uh, they are weathered today, uh, but they give you a very good sense of the original, of what would be, have been the original appearance of this room. And as I mentioned, we'll talk in detail about Roman wall painting, especially because, as you can see, it does depict architecture. We'll begin that conversation on Thursday and continue into next week. I want to turn now to what is surely uh, the most important surviving house at the city of Pompeii, and this is the famous House of the Fawn. If, you have, if you're in Pompeii and you only have time to see two houses, you go to the House of the Vedii and the House of the Fawn. Uh, the House of the Fawn, as you can see from your monument list, dates to the second century BC, for the most part. Uh, and uh, we see a view of part of Pompeii over here with a series of houses marked in yellow. 
And the reason that I show this to you is because the house of the fawn is particularly large. You can see from this plan that it takes up, in fact, the entire block, uh, of the, a, an entire block of the city of Pompeii. Uh, and it is much larger than some of the others. For example, look at the house of the Vedii over here. It's, it's almost, it's, it's twice, if not larger than that, twice the size of the house of the Vedii, if not even more than that. So uh, it's a, 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 a very large house. Clearly, no expense was spared, either in accumulating the property uh, and also in enhancing the decor of the house. If we look at a plan of the House of the Fawn, we will see without question that it corresponds and it follows the Hellenized domus type. <coughs> we enter over here. Uh, we see it has a vestibulum, a vestibulum, a falces, two cellae, one on either side, an atrium with an impluvium, the cubicula here on either side, the wings or the ali. It does have a tablinum. You see it over here. And then it has two. Uh, two peristyle courts uh, with columns encircling them, a smaller one and then a very large one in the back. Note also, while this is on the screen, that there is a very interesting room that is located over here. Uh, it's a rectangular room. It has uh, a couple of columns on bases and pilasters, one on either side. It opens right off the peristyle court. And on the floor of that uh, space, which we call the Alexander Exedra, E-X-E-D-R-A, after Alexander the Great, because on the floor of that was the most famous mosaic that we have surviving from antiquity that represents Alexander the Great. And I'll show you that uh, momentarily. First, let me show you what the house looks like from the outside. It's well preserved. It doesn't have its ceiling the way uh, the house of the Vedii does, but otherwise it's pretty well preserved. We're looking down the street on which it finds itself. You see the polygonal masonry blocks. You see the the um, the uh, the you see the sidewalks here as well and how modern they look. You see the stepping stones. And over here, the facade of the House of the Fawn. You can see the entranceway, and you can see that the entranceway has on either side a pilaster, a pilaster with a Corinthian capital above. And that's very important because it's announcing to us, as did that ideal Hellenized Domus <coughs> that I showed you before, it's announcing to us that this is a patron, this is an owner of this particular house who has leanings toward things Greek uh, and wants us to know that even before we have entered into the house. If you go into the house uh, and stand in the vestibule, uh, you will see that there is still quite a bit of decoration preserved. Uh, the walls are painted with blocks, well, what look like blocks of stone and illusion. Uh, this is an example of first style wall painting. We're going to talk about that on Thursday. And then up here, a shrine is still preserved, a shrine that probably held statues or statuettes of some of the household gods, the revered gods uh, for this family. This is an excellent view because it shows us again how if you're entering this house, you would stand in the vestibule, you'd go from there into the falques, uh, then into the atrium, then into the peristyle that lay beyond the first smaller one and then the larger one after that. But it shows us, again, the point that I've made so many times already just in the, the, this first part of the semester, and that is this Roman interest in vista or panorama. They've set up a view from the moment in which you enter the house, a view of a sequence of experiences from light to dark to light to dark, uh, but also a, a sequence of visual experiences uh, that make uh, entering this house and walking through this house an extraordinary experience, one that they have helped enhance. And you can also see, again, the capitals here. Here's a view of the atrium as it looks today. We are standing in front of the impluvium. Uh, in that impluvium is a statuette in bronze of the dancing fawn from which this house gets its name. The one that you see there now is a copy, and the original is in the Archaeological Museum in Naples. This view also shows you uh, the way in which you had the series of visual experiences from the Falques to the atrium and ultimately toward the peristyle with its wonderful forest of columns done a la Grec uh, in the Greek style. Here's another interesting view. We're still in the atrium. You can see the dancing fawn right here. We're looking at the sidewall. If we're facing the fawn, this is the wall to the left. 
This is very helpful because it shows us exactly what, it would, what the, the cubicula that opened off the atrium would have looked like. You can see that they were very dark. Some of them had these tiny slit windows or perhaps slightly larger slit windows. But for the most part, they were very dark, again, meant only as a place to sleep at night and to be used for no other purpose than that. You can also see from this, this uh, view that this is a rubble wall that has been stuccoed over uh, and that reliefs painted different colors have been placed on that wall. This is an example of so-called first style Roman wall painting and we'll go into, the, into what that was, define what that was and discuss it in more detail on Thursday. This is a wonderful restored view of what the House of the Fawn would have looked like when all of its first style Roman wall painting was intact, uh, showing uh, what it would have looked like to stand in the atrium and look back through what survived of the tablinum with these very large pilasters again announcing the Greek leanings of this particular patron and then the view uh, to, toward the peristyle where you would also see the columns uh, that looked like they were very much in the Greek style. So here's clearly a person who not only is building his home to correspond to the latest in domestic architecture, namely the Hellenized Domus type, but who just wants to make that point over and over and over again, that he's cultivated, that he knows things Greek, uh, and that he uh, has the, the funds to be able to incorporate those into his house. And indeed, first style wall painting, as we'll find out when we discuss it, is also a, t a style that is based on Greek prototypes. So another example of the Greek elements in this building. What room do you think this is? I can't, oh, I didn't show you this on the plan. I neglected to, but you can look at your monument list. You'll see that, that when you look at the plan, you'll see that this house had more than one atrium. It had two atria. And this is one of them. It's a tetra-style atrium, because you can see there are four columns, one around each of the, uh, of the um, one, one around each corner of the impluvium. So a house with two peristyles, a house with two atriums, uh, and even one of the atriums has four columns, as you can see here. And this one is also very useful for the fact, one of you asked me a question when we were looking at the Basilica <coughs> Pompeii about why, uh, you know, why the columns looked the way they did. I think it was you, and you can see, and I mentioned that they were pieced, and here you can see that very well, these drums placed one on top of another, so that you can see over time how easy it would be for some of those to fall off or become dismantled, and for us to be left with the sort of thing that we're left with when we look at what remains in the Basilica of Pompeii. Here's a view, obviously, of one of the peristyles. Here you also see something interesting in terms of building technique. The columns in Pompeii tend to be either of local stone, a local tufa, or made of these um, brick, these tiles that look like bricks, but then in either case, stuccoed over, white, fluted, to make them look once again like they are marble columns. The illusion that they are marble columns, even though they are not, uh, to underscore their Greekness. Uh, this is a view of the, um, that exedra, that Alexander exedra that I mentioned to you before that opens off the first peristyle. Uh, with two columns on bases here, note the red at the bottom, white at the top, two pilasters painted red, as you can see. And you can see the tourists standing there gazing down. Uh, they're gazing down at a copy. And this copy, by the way, for, for a very long time, for as long as I remember going there, except for this last time I was there, uh, there was nothing there. And I think most people had no realization that this amazing mosaic originally was on the floor. Uh, but they have put a copy. The mosaic is now in the Naples Archaeological Museum, long ago moved there. But they finally put a copy down on the floor uh, so that of the mosaic that was there so that people who visit the House of the Fawn realize, oh, this is where uh, the Alexander mosaic was located, which is particularly important because this is a view of the, of the mosaic, this extraordinary mosaic of Alexander the Great that's now in the Naples Archaeological Museum. And of course, you can see that they <coughs> display it there as if it were a panel picture hanging on the wall, but that is not how it was displayed or meant to be displayed in the House of the Fawn. It was a floor pavement in the House of the Fawn. But look how nicely, at least in the museum, they have recreated the ambiance by putting the <coughs> columns and the pilasters. They tried to recreate the sense of the exedra uh, just as it is in the house. It's just that they put the, the mosaic in the wrong place. It should be on the floor. Uh, nonetheless, you can see it's an extraordinary work of art. <coughs> I'm not going to go into 
into it in great detail, but I did want to expose you to it because it is so important and so magnificent. And I also want to make absolutely sure that you don't miss when you go to the Naples, to the Pompeii area, you do not miss going to the Archaeological Museum in Naples. It's an amazing museum, one of the greatest of all the museums in Italy, and it has, of course, almost all the great stuff that comes from Pompeii is at that museum uh, today. So it's a, a, another one of those asterisk must-sees. Uh, you look at it here, it represents the battle between Alexander and the Persian king Darius, D-A-R-I-U-S, at the famous Battle of Isis, I-S-S-U-S. Uh, and uh, at that battle, Alexander was victorious. Uh, and uh, you see it here. And one of the reasons that it's so important for our understanding of the House of the Fawn is that we believe that this mosaic was a copy of an earlier lost Greek painting, a Greek painting of this same scene of Alexander and Darius done in around 300 BC by a Greek painter that was copied for this house in mosaic. Uh, sometime in the second century BC. So it's another example of this patron, of this owner of the house, who is so besotted uh, with Greek art that he wants to have as much of it around him as he possibly can. And he clearly has the assets that enable him to uh, commission uh, a mosaicist to make this amazing painting. Now there are a lot of people who talk about this this uh, this mosaic. Excuse me. A lot of people who talk about this mosaic and they say, well, you know, it's such a pale reflection of what the painting would have been, and you know, it's a typical derivative Roman art. They had to look at Greek art and derive from it. They couldn't come up with anything on their own. But I would maintain that's absolutely untrue. But I would also maintain that to do this kind of work in mosaic rather than paint, is much more difficult. I mean, this is a true tour de force to be able to create this kind of active battle scene with collapsing horses and uh, with, um, with spears in the sky foreshortened and foreshortened weapons down here. This is an amazing thing to do in mosaic. When you think of all of these individual tesserae, these small stones, sto stones, multicolored stones that had to be brought together, placed in mortar uh, to create this amazing tableau. It, to me, it seems like it is a much, much greater feat to have to achieve that and to achieve it so well in mosaic uh, than in paint. Just quickly, a couple of details. Here's the one of Alexander himself on his horse. It's an incredible characterization of the great Hellenistic uh, uh, general and king. Uh, and you see him on his favorite horse, Bucephalus, here. And I think it's a wonderful characterization by this particular very talented mosaicist and his workshop uh, to capture uh, the relationship of man and horse. I mean, if you look at not only the eyes, but also at the hair, the hair of Alexander tousled, flowing in the wind, the mane of the horse, so closely allied with one another. The artist has really very effectively captured that, again, even just using these very small pieces of stone, uh, which you can see very well here. Look at the way the shadows that are cast, uh, you know, even by that stone. It's, it's incredible. Here's the other detail uh, that I'm going to show you of Darius uh, in his chariot. Uh, he, his driver, as you can see, he's looking toward Alexander. He's mesmerized by the great Hellenistic king, but he's at the same time afraid. Uh, and he's beating a retreat, because you can see that his driver has turned the chariot around. He's whipping the horse, and he's heading in the other direction, away from Alexander, as is this figure here. We see his horse from the rear, a real tour de force of depicting a horse. Uh, but he, too, is looking at Alexander, quite afraid, and his horse is also turning uh, to go off into the distance. So capturing this very dramatic moment. And to me, the most wonderful uh, detail is this one that you see down here, which is a view of one of the fallen Persians. The shield is, is falling over on him, but the shield is, sh is, 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 is polished to such a shine that he can see the reflection of his own face. I have a detail to show you of this. He can see the reflection, you see it here, of his own face in that shield. And this view is particularly good. I took this one very close up so that you could see uh, the individual stones. You don't, you know, from a distance, they blend. But when you go up close, you can really see, oh yeah, that's, that's a mosaic. And it's, it's really an extraordinary work of art. Very quick question, because... How, how big are the stones? Are they They're very small. They're very small. And the reason for that is in large part so that they will blend ultimately, and from a distance, it will have the feel of a painting, certainly when it's on the wall, probably less so when you stood and looked at it in its original location, because you'd be looking down on it and you'd be closer 
uh, to it than here. But it's an amazing work. And again, remember that although the original painting done by the Greek painter was probably d did hang on a wall, uh, this one was meant as a floor mosaic in this house. But again, a testament to the Greek leanings of this particular patron. Now, I also wanted to show you that's not the only mosaic in Pompeii. It's the greatest by far, and it's, it's without question, and I think everyone who studies this stuff would agree with me, that it's the, the finest surviving mosaic in the history of, of ancient Greek and Roman art. Uh, but there are plenty of other mos mosaics preserved, including at Pompeii. And I want to show you just one. It's mentioned underneath the Alexander mosaic on your monument list because it's so beloved. It's even more beloved by most tourists to the site than the Alexander mosaic, which after all you can't see on the site. You have to see in, in Naples, at least the original. But uh, this is the so-called Kawe Kana mosaic, and it belongs to the house of the tragic poet, a house that was put up between 62 and 79 AD. And you see what's meant to be a very ferocious dog with his teeth bared. This one is done much more simply in only three colors, mainly black and white, tesserae, or s small stones, T-E-S-S-E-R-A-E. -E. It's what these small stones are called, the tesserae. Black and white, basically black on white. Uh, but you can see that there's one touch of red, the collar of the dog. And the dog is chained, as you can see, just like that poor uh, plaster cast of the dog that we saw last time. He's chained, but he's meant to look very ferocious. He's baring his teeth. And the whole point, Kawe Kanem, beware of dog, is for you to be uh, warned of the fact that if you dare step any further than that vestibulum and try to get into this house or try to steal anything or whatever, this dog uh, will attack. So it's the same kind of, it's like a security alarm system ac actually for antiquity. And you can, I bet you can tell me where in the house this uh, mosaic was located. Neil? In the, in the vestibulum or the foul case of the house? Yeah, probably the vestibulum, actually. Uh, indeed, the vestibulum of the house, so that even before you got into as far as the foul case, you were warned uh, that you'd better beware of the dog. And this thing, I mean, you will see this. Any of you who've been to Pompeii know this and can attest that I'm right. Uh, every single souvenir stand <laughs> anywhere within any, any numbers of yards of Pompeii is selling the Kawe Kanem on everything you can possibly imagine. The mugs, the t-shirts, the hot plates, the whatever, the tote bags, you can get the Kawe Kanem in every uh, shape, size, and possibility. And I have one of those myself. Only one, only one hot plate, but that's it. I, I, I did it. I did it like everybody else at one point years ago. Uh, I want to show you briefly a couple of other houses just to make uh, some, a, a few small points, uh, well, important points. Uh, an important point or two about each of them. The first one is the house of Menander in Pompeii, which dates to the second century BC and later. Uh, you see it in plan here. The house of the Menander, like everything else we've seen uh, in the latter part of this lecture, is a Hellenized domus. Uh, you can tell that because of the peristyle here. In other respects, it's very similar to everything we've seen, the usual falces, atrium, cubiculum, tablinum system, the uh, large peristyle up here, and some dining spaces opening off that peristyle. What makes this particular house interesting, and the reason that I show it to you, is it's a good illustration of what happens when, over time, you remodel, and also over time when other uh, property becomes available nearby. And we can tell from this plan that what happened here is that the core of the house was added to as property on either side. Additional property became available, and this owner purchased that property and added it. Uh, and the plan becomes much more irregular, obviously, because of that. An addition over here, an addition over here. You know, some of that sense of axiality and symmetry is lost when you start to add to either side horizontally. Uh, but there are lots of houses like this, and it's one of the things one needs to keep in mind as one, um, as one visits the city and as one looks at uh, each of these incredible structures. Just very quickly, uh, with regard to the house, just as you have a sense of what it looks like today, it's named the House of Menander because of this painting of the poet uh, who sits on a chair over there uh, on one of the walls of the house. Uh, the uh, part of the peristyle is actually quite well preserved, as is the atrium. We're standing in the atrium, as you can obviously see, with the impluvium looking back toward the garden. This is Interesting because you can see again the, the uh, cubicula opening off either side, but also because of the incorporation, just as in the House of the Fawn, of columns elsewhere than just in the peristyle. These in that transition place between 
the atrium and the, um, the garden, the so-called tablinum space, these very large columns stuccoed over, fluted, and you can see in this case not painted red at the bottom but a kind of bright yellow to match the colors of the wall. So again, this incorporation of Greek elements into houses like this one. This is also a good view. It's a very well-preserved house. Uh, we're back in the atrium again. You can see the way in which the cubicula, the small cubicula, open off that. You can see some of the paintings. And here's the entranceway through the foul case. And you can see in this particular case a small shrine that's located in the corner, the purpose of that for the household to display uh, the household gods. This is another interesting house that I just want to treat fleetingly. It's the so-called House of Panza in Pompeii, and it dates to the second century BC. Uh, and it's a very large house, as you can see, like all the other Hellenized uh, domuses, because we see that it has a peristyle uh, with columns here. Uh, it, like all the others, it has everything that we've seen, the vestibulum, the falces, the atrium, the cubicula, the wings or ally, the tablinum, a dining room. Uh, and uh, a bevy of shops down here, in fact, more shops than we have seen uh, be the case in most of the houses we've looked at, uh, at least five, if not six, shops down here, which gives us something of a clue to something that might be going on in this house. If we go back to the peristyle and we take a look at that, we see that there's a pool in, in between the columns. And you might speculate, oh, how nice, you know, a nice pleasant pool, you could sit around, you could you know, dip your hands or your feet into that pool, a nice pleasurable spot to enjoy. Well, actually, it wasn't that at all. We think now that it was probably a pool that held fish. Uh, and fish, not fish just attractive fish that one could admire, but actually fish that, one, that were sold in one of the shops in front. One of the reasons we believe that is a scholar by the name of Wilhelmina Yashemsky, whose specialty is gardens of Pompeii, has spent her whole scholarly career, and it was well worth it because she's come up with some extraordinary things, on studying the root marks uh, of the gardens in Pompeii. And she's been able to demonstrate through studying those and working with experts on that sort of thing just what was grown in these gardens. And you find that some of them were pleasure gardens with beautiful flowers, and some of them were produce gardens. And this one was a produce garden, so that there would have been vegetables and fruits and so on that were, that were gardened here. Uh, and then you, and then they were sold in the shops that were located at the front. So here we see a wonderful example of the way in which uh, these houses could even be used by some owners as a means of income uh, for them and for their families. And that was surely the case with the House of Panza. It also has a very well-preserved peristyle. We can see the columns here around that pool that was used to hold the fish that were sold in one of the shops. Uh, the columns are extremely well preserved, including some of the capitals, ionic capitals, as you can see here, and the fluting, and then the plain, you know, the stuccoed over at the bottom with the paint. You can see in this case remains of the red paint that would have decorated the bottom part of those uh, columns. Another very interesting house, uh, well, you know, interesting house, and one that's important for us because it marks. A, uh, a later development in a Roman house architecture in Pompeii is the house of Marcus Loreus Tibertinus. Remember, Tiber was the ancient word for Tivoli, and so it's likely that Tibertinus, in fact, came from Tivoli, moved to Pompeii, and built this large house uh, sometime between the earthquake and the eruption of Vesuvius, so 62 to 79 AD. Like the House of the Fawn, it took up an entire city block. Uh, and, but you can see that the owner has made a different decision than the owner of the House of the Fawn because the house itself takes up very little space, and most of the space is taken up by the garden. We're less sure here whether this was a pleasurable garden. There, there are some indications that it might have been, or whether it too was used as a produce garden. We don't have all those shops on the front, so that seems less likely here. But you can see it's another example of the way in which these houses uh, are becoming not only more personalized, uh, but also with much more emphasis on the garden and on the dining rooms that are surrounding that garden. We see one of those dining rooms here. What's particularly interesting about this house, and one that helps us round the circle to where I began at the beginning of the lecture when I talked about the fact that it was between 62 and 79 that the, that the Pompeians began to build second stories on their houses. 
uh, they, ex they, they began to s expand vertically, and we saw the canoculi of the Via del Abundanza building. We see the same thing happening here, that a second story has been added around the living quarters. Now here it was obviously really needed because they weren't giving much space to the living quarters, so they had to build up vertically for those. And if you look very carefully at the restored view, you will see that the windows of that second story open off uh, and look out over onto the compluvium of the, um, of the atrium. You see that there, the compluvium of the atrium, and then around it you can see the second story uh, with the windows looking out over the compluvium of the house. Then the rest, needless to say, garden. It's actually pretty well preserved. It's fun to wander around. You see these wonderful trellises and uh, all kinds of, of ar interesting architectural forms that for, that, that are part of this incredible garden in the house of Tibertinus. And you even see there this magnificent grotto, uh, which leads me to believe that we're beginning to see something interesting here, which is the incorporation of the sorts of things that you would tend to see in villas, not right in the center of a city, uh, but villas that were located either outside the city or along, or along the coast, or along the coast. Uh, and, um, we, and the reason I say that here is because we can see this grotto-like effect uh, where we have what looks like a pebbled effect on the back wall painted a, a two columns, Corinthian columns, with um, uh, a pediment above and then these two wonderful mythological paintings. This one you probably recognize as the myth of Narcissus. You can see his reflection in the water. He's admiring himself and his reflection down below. And then Pyramus and Thisbe over here. What's important to us is not which myths, but just that Greek myths are incorporated into the scheme here. So this uh, pretension toward things Greek. Uh, but most important, this sort of this grotto-like element that you would tend to find in a villa along the Amalfi <coughs> Coast or some such rather than in downtown uh, Pompeii. Uh, so we're beginning to see this interesting merging, at least for the very well-to-do, the rich and famous, as we, the lifestyles of the rich and famous, as this, uh, as this lecture is called. Uh, we begin to see that in some of the houses, especially in the later period. I'd like to, the la one of the second to last uh, building that I want to show you is an extremely important one. The last one we'll just look at for a, a minute or so. But this, this one is an extremely important building. It is the Villa of the Mysteries in Pompeii. It is indeed a villa, uh, so it's a nice segue from the Lareus Tibertinus house. Uh, what started to happen in Pompeii, even though there was quite a bit of space initially, as time went on, things became more crowded, and the really well-to-do began to move outside the city to the, to the suburbs, so to speak, right outside the city. Interestingly enough, right along those same streets that form the cemeteries of the city. So we see the villas and the cemeteries intermixing in a very natural way. Uh, but this very important villa uh, was part of that development. And I want to say it, it went through a couple of phases, and I want to show you the two phases here. Uh, the phase, only phase two is on your monument list. I won't hold you responsible for phase one, but I think it's important for us to look at it together. Uh, because what we see here is something very interesting. Uh, we're looking at the top, we see the entrance into the villa. We see the peristyle there, the atrium there, and the tablinum there. Now, what do you think about that? I mean, it's very strange. We've never seen a house, that, a house or villa that departed uh, from the scheme that we talked about before, from this movement from the entranceway, the falces, into the peristyle first, then into the atrium, then into the tablinum. It's a different progression. Uh, we we might, might think to ourselves, well, this must be the, the whim of this particular patron, but Vitruvius tells us otherwise. Vitruvius tells us about villa design, and he tells us the major distinction between Roman villas and Roman houses in terms of their plan is that in Roman villas, you enter into the peristyle first. So it shows, again, the growing interest in peristyles. Uh, and yet this peristyle, very, very early indeed, uh, because it belongs uh, to the first phase, which is even before uh, the, or, or you know, even before the early second century AD, which is when, uh, second century BC, which is when the second phase uh, is dated. We can also see here a great podium. Uh, and I'll say a bit more about the podium as we look at phase two. This is phase two. 
of the house. And this is the one that you have of the villa. This is the one that you have on your monument list. The main spaces are, are uh, labeled here. You can see the entranceway, the falques, the peristyle first, a very large peristyle, the atrium of the house here, the tablinum over here. So this different order described by Vitruvius. We can see also that it rests on a tall podium. I'll show you what it looks like in a moment. It is a podium that looks exactly like the podia we saw for the great sanctuaries at Tivoli and Palestrina. <coughs> we see that underneath that podium, just as at those, or Jupiter, Anxer, Terracina, just as at Terracina, we see there's a cryptoporticus, or underground passageway, underneath that podium. It is barrel vaulted, and the, and the um, Concrete is faced with opus and kertum work, just as we saw it in the uh, sanctuaries. Why have this kind of podium here? Uh, to give the villa an even grander appearance, to put it up high on top of a podium, and also to help to, uh, to uh, muffle the sounds from the street. Remember, there's a major street, uh, a, a thoroughfare that le that's just left the city and has become an intercity road uh, to muffle the sounds that one would hear from that by raising the villa, in a sense, away from them. The most important point, though, that I can make about this villa and something that speaks to the future is the fact that we are beginning to see, we've talked about how enclosed and plain and severe the earlier exteriors of Roman houses were, even up through the Hellenized domus, except perhaps for the addition of a pilaster or a column here and there. Here we see something entirely new happening. We see that the architect has designed these elements that project out of the, uh, the, the rectangle of the villa plan uh, and are curved. And you can see one over here and, most importantly, one over here. It's like a giant bay window uh, with, um, with, you know, with views uh, that can be seen through that bay window. So this projecting out into the viewer's space and so on, and, and also into the space of those who live inside this building, offering wonderful panoramas and vistas of the sea beyond. The sea was closer to Pompeii at that point than it actually is today. Beautiful views out onto the sea, uh, and the, the, in a sense, the exterior of the structure breaking out of its, uh, out of its rectangular bonds uh, to do something entirely different from what has come. Before. This is a restored view of what that uh, structure would have looked like in its second phase, and I think you can see that very well here. Resting on this tall podium, arcades just as at the sanctuaries. These are blind arcades, just as we saw there. Concrete opus and keratum facing. But look at the difference that this uh, having this bay window has made. They've opened up the wall. The windows are very large. No more slit windows. Big panoramic windows, projecting elements also with very large windows. There's hardly any wall there whatsoever. The rest is the same. The compluvium, the peristyle, all look like they did in the Hellenized domus. But this is a big change and one that uh, looks forward again to the future. This is a view of it as it looks today, the Villa of the Mysteries. You can see the great podium over here with its blind arcades, as well as part of the house. And look at how open that house is. Now, part of this is villas. You know, there's more of a desire when you build a villa to open it up, uh, more so than a house in town. But it's also an important development for architecture as a whole. This is a view of the peristyle court. It's a little different than any other peristyle court we've seen, because you can see they have embedded the columns into the wall uh, of the, uh, uh, the wall of the, there's a wall around it. The columns are embedded into that which is a different motif. And I thought you'd be amused to see that um, the, the Villa of the Mysteries is one of those. And there are several places in Italy, many places in Italy, where people go in particular to take photos of after their wedding, to take photos of themselves, photo op places. Uh, and the Villa Myster of the Mysteries is one of them. So you don't be at all surprised if you are there, especially on a weekend, uh, if you see a wedding party taking photos. And this was one of the more discreet photos. You can just imagine the kinds of poses that people take in, in places like this. I could have shown you all kinds of very amusing, very loving photos of the bride and groom. But here you just get a sense of uh, and the photographer. And there were several photographers the day I took this, uh, getting wonderful um, uh, images of this bride and groom after the happy event. I just want to close just very briefly with the um, with this last house or this mosaic fountain from this last house. 
It's the so-called House of the Large Fountain, so-called because of this extraordinary fountain that was found there and still exists. Dates to between the earthquake and the eruption of Vesuvius, 62 to 79 AD. It's very well preserved. You see it here on the right-hand side of the screen. It shows you that mosaics could be applied to any kind of surface by these very talented artists. Uh, this, in this case, uh, applied to a curved surface, as you can see very well here. Once again, using multicolored tesserae, as we saw in the Alexander mosaic. And you can only imagine how lovely it was when there was actually a water display and so on. In fact, so lovely that it was imitated almost exactly for the Getty Villa in Malibu, which I show you on the left-hand side of the screen. Uh, many of you have probably been there. The Getty Villa, it looks like Disneyland, I know, but it probably gives you a better sense of what a Roman villa looked like in antiquity than anything else, even that you can see in Rome, because it's in such pristine shape. Uh, and it really gives you, it is, it is based, for any of you who don't know, it is actually based ex on, an, on, a, on a villa from Herculaneum that was excavated. We know it. It's based very closely on it, the so-called Villa of the Papyri at Herculaneum. Uh, and then it picks and chooses, you know, it looks at other things as well and incorporates them as it incorporated this fountain. But it probably gives you, it's in better condition. Uh, you can see that the water display is actually working, <laughs> unlike the one in Pompeii. So it gives you a very good sense of what this thing would have looked like in antiquity. And just as a look forward, uh, one of the paper topics for this course actually is to, is to uh, talk about the Villa of the Papyri in the context in part and being helped by uh, the re reconstruction at the Getty Museum. On Thursday, we will move on to Herculaneum. We will talk about the lives of the people there, some of the houses that were built there between the eruption of, uh, between the earthquake and Vesuvius. And we will also begin our conversation about first style and second style Roman wall painting. Uh, we'll have a few lectures on painting because it's so important as the interior decoration of these homes and because, as we'll see, it depicts architecture. And you can get a sense of that here in ways that are very intriguing uh, and that tell us even more about buildings uh, than we already know. Thanks, everybody, for a good afternoon. Good morning. <laughs>